Hello and welcome to Tech Talk. I'm your host Seth Miller and we're talking bandwidth and future technologies today with FinCom CTO Bill Milroy. Bill, welcome to the show. Thank you Seth, it's a pleasure to be with you. Uh, there's a lot of talk in the industry these days about bandwidth, just how much do we need. We've heard a lot of numbers, 12 megabits per passenger, 100 megabits per aircraft. What's the real answer? How much do we actually need on a plane? Well, I read the same numbers that you do, and 12 megabit per second is something certainly systems can sustain, but only for a very small period of time in a, what's called a bursty mode. So a, out of a total second, maybe that will be for some small fraction of the second. It turns out that folks are finding out, and people like SES and other folks are quoting, that these numbers are more like in the 150 to 300 kilobit per second, much lower number when taken as a blended part. By blended, what I mean is, there are cases where you're going to be bursty, particularly uh, people who are going to be streaming. But remember, when people have a session, some people aren't going to be doing any data at all. They're going to be composing an email while they're online. People are going to be texting. People are going to be browsing. People are going to be doing social media. And for sure, people are going to be uh, streaming as well. But when you take that all into account, the number today rolls up to 150 to 300 kilobit per second, undoubtedly going up in time. All right. So it's going to go up, and when we start talking about the demands, obviously someone who's composing an email, like you said, is not consuming anything at that moment. But for a true home or office experience, what are some of the sort of sample numbers of what it takes to deliver that in terms of bandwidth? Well, again, I think that probably the 150 or 300 is the right one on average. But I think what you're asking is I think probably 1 to 3 megabit per second is kind of the number we want. That would allow you to do an SD kind of streaming capability. Obviously, you could download large files. But it's highly variable. And, and also, there is some disagreement amongst the experts in this area in terms of exactly what that number is. So that's a lot of bandwidth to deliver. We're talking hundreds of megabits potentially to the aircraft. Obviously, there's a lot of different moving parts that go into making that happen. Can you give us a little bit of idea of what some of that is in terms of the antenna and some of the other pieces on board? Sure. It's generally the product of the spectral efficiency. That's a number uh, one to three or four for the antenna multiplied by the channel bandwidth. And that gives you the total throughput. So for instance, if we have an antenna system that's doing two to three bits per hertz, and we have 125 megahertz channel bandwidth, that would be 250 to 375 megabit per second that would be available to that plane uh, for, for use uh, for the, the multiple users. So spectral efficiency, which is the thing we really control on the antenna side, uh, that two to three uh, number is really driven by a couple of things. One is the overall gain efficiency of the antenna, the gain, the, it's referred to as the G on T on the receive side. But a higher G on T number is better than a lower G on T number. But it's also driven by what's called ASI, adjacent satellite interference. So on receive, because the satellites are very closely spaced, if your antenna beam is, is wide or your side lobes, that's energy in areas you don't want it to be, is high, then you're going to be jammed. You're going to be sensitive to adjacent satellite interference, and that's going to drop your bit per hertz, and that's going to drop your efficiency. On the transmit side, there's actually regulatory requirements that say if your beam is fatter than it should be or the side lobes are higher than they should be, we're, you're going to have to operate by regulatory decree at a lower spectral efficiency. So all these things are bad for overall data rates. So the best antenna is one that can work at these higher bit rates, has the adjacent satellite interference compatibility to be able to carry these high bit per hertz. The modem plays a role here too, and I don't want to minimize that, but the modem has to be able to provide the, the product of the spectral density times the channel bandwidth. So that's going to work great in terms of understanding how it's playing with the geostationary networks today. Um, as we start looking into the future, we've got an O3B or a OneWeb talking about LEO and MEO networks. That changes some of these requirements in terms of connectivity and communications. How does the antenna play into that? Well, for sure. There's a lot of distinctions, that, a lot of special things you need to bring. But I would say the top two would be the channel bandwidth, because these systems are really starting at like 250 uh, megahertz of channel bandwidth because they need to push a lot of data. I mean, that's part of the, the beauty of the systems. The second one is the beam agility. So these satellites, unlike geosynchronous satellites, are moving across the sky. So they put more onus on the antenna to be able to track them as they move, more than what, what's required generally for a geosynchronous satellite. However, it's important to remember that these satellites set. So since you want to have continuous service, as one satellite sets, another one is rising, and you need to be able to get the beam over very quickly, and this drives you up into some pretty large numbers, 400 to 1200 degrees per second required, and not all antennas are able to uh, support that. All right, and you say not everybody can do it. Are there solutions out there that are able to deliver this today? Well, for instance, the uh, FinCom's VIX antenna that we supply uh, for GOGO's 2KU, uh, GOGO is on record, and they're correct, that that system is OneWeb compatible for the KU constellation. We're hoping that constellation will become available at uh, the end of the decade, and when it will, 
and become available, we'll be able to use that on the 2KU system as an example. And so that gets us through the KU and KA space a little bit. Looking out beyond that into sort of the past the horizon, as it were, into what the next sort of big leaps are. What are some of the other technologies that may not exist yet in the commercial space that we have to start thinking about for truly future-proofing and where this is all going to go? By your question, I think you mean not just something that's going to squeeze a little more juice out of the grape, but get a whole lot larger grape. So something that's really quantum. Well, what people are talking about, and actually the military is already doing, is going to higher frequency bands. And the higher frequency bands are good, not because they're just higher, but because there's more unallocated bandwidth. It's a, it's a new frontier. There's a lot of bandwidth available that hasn't been claimed by anyone. So for instance, military systems use Q-band. That's 45 gigahertz. In fact, we make aeronautical Q-band antennas for the, for the military. And so they're already on that, that path. The military is also talking about using E-band. That's 71 to 76 and 81 to 86 gigahertz. So that's 10 gigahertz of bandwidth. That's way more than what's available at KU or KA today. So that's very exciting. It's, going to, it's not something that's going to happen tomorrow, but something we can look forward to in the future. And maybe as a clue that maybe things are going to come sooner than, than, than we think, Boeing recently, within the last few months, filed for a 3,000 satellite LEO constellation operating in Q-band and in V-band, those higher frequencies. And that system, although it is intended also for the military, is really intended primarily for a commercial system. We'll have to wait and see if they actually build that constellation. But I think it's a good sign that these higher frequencies and the higher bandwidths they're going to enable may be coming sooner rather than later. Great. Thanks very much. And thank you all for joining us on Tech Talk. Stay tuned for our next episode coming soon.